Today's saint, Rose of Viterbo, is a little obscure saint. I mean, she's pretty well known throughout Italy, but outside of Italy, not too well known. She was born in the 12, 1233, so quite a number of years ago, right? Almost 93, 93 years ago. And her life began in great holiness even as a young child. She had extraordinary graces, a truly chosen soul. Every once in a great while you see this. I've seen it. A young person with extreme holiness. I witnessed it myself in a young person who died at a very young age who expressed in their life extreme holiness. Now, Rose of Ichirba, when she was just three years old, her aunt had died. And as everyone was crying around her aunt's body, little uh, Rose walked up to her aunt's body, put her hand on her aunt's shoulder, and said her aunt's name, and her aunt was brought back to life. It kind of caused a bit of a stir. <laughs> and so as Rose continued to grow, she began to become a little walking saint. At a very young age, she began to pray, and she was given extraordinary grace, the innocence of her prayers. She committed herself at a very young age to the Lord. Now, perhaps we can think something like that would be impossible for such a young child, but let's not forget little Jacinta at Fatima was no more than six when Our Lady appeared to her. At seven years old, she saw hell. Little Jacinta began to do incredible penance for the conversion of souls and for the Holy Father, the Pope. 800 years before Jacinta, or seven, 600 years, 700 years before Jacinta, was Rose. And Rose was one of those young chosen souls who prayed and did penance throughout her young life for the conversion of sinners. At the age of 10, our Lord appeared to her, scourged and beaten, hanging upon the cross. And she said, my Lord, who did this to you? And he said, sinners have done this to me. Very similar to little Jacinta you know, who would see uh, hell and then see the Immaculate Heart of Mary and want to do penance in reparation for sins against the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So little Rose wanted to do reparation for sinners and to obtain for them the grace of conversion. At 10 years old, she actually started walking through the streets with the crucifix in her hand, calling out to the town people to do penance, to look to what they did to the Lord, <laughs> and to turn around and change their lives. And she brought about the conversion of many people because of her little faith, or this little soul with great faith. She was able to bring many people to conversion. And just as little Jacinta of Fatima was very concerned about the Holy Father, so Rose, at a very young age, got involved in politics. At the age of 15 years old, uh, the town of Viterbo was kind of political stuff going on between the papal states and and the emperor and so forth. And uh, she got very involved in the politics of it and demanded that Viterbo return to one of the papal states and so forth. And um, uh, she eventually was heard. <laughs> she was, she was, uh, the, the Holy Father responded and so did the return of Viterbo to the papal state. She got very involved politically as a young woman, but it was mostly concerned about the Holy Father and this town being one of the papal states, the authority of the Holy Father. And she prayed very much for the Holy Father. She died at a very young age, at 17 years old. She wanted to enter the Poor Clares, but because she was poor, she didn't have the dowry to enter a monastery. And so she said to the sisters, well, you won't receive me in life, but you will receive me in death. So after she died, twice she appeared to the Pope and told the Pope to let the sisters move her dead body from the regular graveyard to the convent monastery. And so the Holy Father said to them, you know what, uh, she's bugged me twice uh, since she's died. Would you mind moving her body into the monastery? <laughs> and so they did. And so Rose is buried in the poor Clare convent because from heaven she insisted that uh, to the Holy Father that her body be moved. And so as she prophesied, uh, she did end her years and the rest of her eternity, her remains are with the poor Clares in Viterbo. And her body to this day is incorrupt. She is one of the incorruptibles, uh, one of those like Jacinta of Fatima, whose body is incorrupt. Now, she's a good one to speak about today because we have in our gospel 
uh, the Pharisees coming to Jesus and um, and saying that the disciples of John the Baptist fast, and they fast, how come his disciples aren't fasting? And our Lord says, well, you can't pour new wine to old wineskins. You can't fast when the bridegroom is with you. You've got to wait till the party's over. And so what was happening is as the Lord was coming to us, there is the rejoicing, the jubilation that the bridegroom is here. The groom has come to wet himself to the church. And he's bringing with him the new wine. In other words, in the Old Testament, fasting and penance had the effect of just simply expressing expressing uh, penance or, rep- or um, uh, repentance for one's past sins. In the New Covenant, with the coming of Christ Jesus, penance and fasting has a new power. It has a new authority. It is a new wine. It is more potent wine, we can say, because through baptism we are united to Christ Jesus, And what we suffer through prayer and fasting, these willful acts of love, uniting those sufferings of fasting and prayer and penance to that of Christ on the cross, it now has a new authority, a new power, a much greater potency. It's not simply an exterior act expressing sorrow. It now has the capacity to obtain grace for oneself and, and others. It is now part of the passion of Christ. Penance and prayer, when offered in union with the cross of Christ Jesus, becomes part of his passion and becomes part of the eternal offering to the Father. And we participate in the passion. So it's the new wine going into the new wineskins when we fast and pray now. So the Lord gives this three years of reprieve of fasting and penance while he is there proclaiming the gospel. And then when the new wine comes, the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we receive those graces of baptism and confirmation. Then the fasting and penance becomes something far more powerful, far more potent, and it is something new, something more wonderful, something the old covenant could have never dreamed of. Only in the new covenant, the new wines can can contain such a grace. And in the state of grace, when we fast, when we do penance, Our fasting and penance are united to the cross of Christ Jesus, offered to the Father, and it has the effect of unleashing grace upon the world. Today is the first Friday, right? What do we do? We're making reparation for sins against the sacred heart of Jesus. We are offering our penance, our prayer, to unleash grace upon souls who are steeped in sin, that they might find forgiveness and mercy that they may receive the grace of conversion. And those graces are being poured out upon souls we may not even know. Somewhere in this world, some soul in grave need of God's grace is receiving that grace because of our prayers and our penances offered in union with Christ Jesus. St. Rose understood this from a very, very early age. And she unleashed a flood of grace upon the soul. Little Jacinta of Fatima understood it. And so did the many saints throughout the centuries. Simple folk understand it because it just makes sense to unite our sufferings to those of Christ and to unleash upon the world the ocean of God's mercy. May God bless you. And Mary keep.